Can Apple News Plus save magazines? And how is Microsoft planning to change phones and tablets? Vertical Hold is proudly sponsored by CASA Systems, taking Australian technology to the global market. Welcome to Vertical Hold Behind the Tech News, where we talk to Australia's leading technology journalists to get the stories behind the news of the week. I'm Alex Kidman, and once again, Adam Turner is busy enjoying the delights of Japan on a well-earned break, so the wonderful Lee Stark from Picker is sitting in his big comfy chair. One tip, Lee, if you find any snacks in the lining of the chair, it's probably best not to eat them. What about the money that's sitting here? Turner had money? Mine! All mine! This week, we're looking into the decision, such as it isn't, around the ACCC's block of the TPG Vodafone merger and the launch of Apple News Plus in Australia. And for that, I've called on the expertise of Jez Ford, editor of Sound and Image and Australian Science Illustrated magazines, and a man with, let's say, just a lot of magazine publishing experience. Thanks for being here, Jez. Evening. We'll be catching up with Jez a little bit later to talk Apple News, But first off, Microsoft has made a big splash this week, although rather cruelly, I'm going to very quickly skip over the things you're going to be able to buy first. This is the new Surface Pro 7 and the Surface Laptop 3. They're fundamentally spec upgrades, although the Surface Laptop 3 has a sort of interesting uh, AMD processor meant to be quite custom to Microsoft. But uh, there's more interesting fare on offer, isn't there, Lee? Yeah, um, there there are three actually interesting gadgets that they've announced. Um, One of them will be available this year, and the other two won't. So the one that will be available this year is uh, the Surface Pro X, which I I really hope they call it the X as opposed to how Apple did the whole X as 10 thing. Uh, But basically, it's a thinner, lighter version of a Surface Pro uh, with uh, minimal bezels, um, obviously... Uh, still fast, but it's uh, it's powered by a Microsoft design chip, which rather looks and feels like it's more of like an, uh, a phone pro- sort of processor uh, because it's always on. It's got a 4G connection. It's got some Qualcomm uh, mobile connectivity there. So basically, it's a proper tablet, like the way you might expect one from uh, Apple or, 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 or Google or Samsung, um, but it's made to be like a Surface, so it's kind of sleek. That's the one that's coming this year. The more interesting devices that microsoft announced are the surface neo and surface duo and despite the first one's name it is not part of the matrix that, that, looked, was a that really joke. was a I'm terrible really joke. i did want to circle <laughs> back really quickly on the surface pro x though because there's a couple of interesting things there fundamentally though because it's yeah. it's an arm based surface device and i think the last time we had an arm based surface device it was the surface rt and the surface rt i still have nightmares that thing was horrible this should well, be a lot better, though. Well, okay, so there have been ARM-based, if I recall correctly, there have been ARM-based Surface-style products. That, like Nokia uh, had one recently, and obviously I think Samsung did as well. But as you said, yeah, Microsoft hasn't done an ARM-based um, Surface itself for a while, and uh, it wasn't a great device. It was a Windows 8 device when Windows 8 wasn't quite sure whether it was a tablet or a, or, or a desktop-style operating system, and it was not a good device, I think. I think it's kind of like the Zune. We all just kind of ju- just look back and say, so Microsoft made some hardware, and then we move on. This kind of looks like it'll be a lot better because my understanding is it will run proper Windows 10 Pro, um, and obviously, Microsoft has had some experimentation over the past couple of years with Windows 10 S, uh, which, again, that was on those uh, devices that ran uh, Qualcomm processors in the past as well. Um, so, yeah, I think this one's interesting. I'm unsure what it's going to be like running applications not made by Microsoft on this new processor. That's the thing I'm sort of like curious about because because this is going to be geared at creatives. That's generally the the gist uh, the, the the place that microsoft likes to target its surface computers at and certainly with a thinner and lighter pen and the fact that it's always on you can kind of see that's where they're heading to so i'm kind of curious how adobe software for instance is going to run on a chip this kind of foreign to the windows environment but it's out i think well, in november this sometime. is the other interesting thing so, that i don't think a lot of australian outlets have picked up on 
Uh, on the on the mm. Adobe front, I believe that that stuff is covered, but it's more when you get into slightly obscure drivers and older Windows software that that shift from x86 to ARM. Yeah, that's maybe got some compatibility issues, and it's one of those questions that nobody seems to be able to fully answer. And to be fair, to fully answer it, you'd have to have every piece of Windows software ever written, and I don't think even Microsoft has that. Yeah, but uh, in, in kind of checking the prices and details on this, I notice on Microsoft. Australian store site, they say, you know, it'll cost, I think, from sixteen ninety nine from the 19th of November. They have this little caveat, which says, Surface Pro X has not yet been authorised under ACMA rules. Actual sale delivery is contingent on compliance with applicable ACMA requirements. So that'll be, that, that, I'm what? quoting verbatim from Microsoft's site. That will presumably be down to the LTE huh. configuration they have in this thing. I can't imagine that it would particularly fail. But maybe someone hasn't done the paperwork yet. Yeah. Maybe there's some super obscure thing happening that might fall foul of the way that our telecommunications you know, infrastructure is protected in that sense. You've got to be very careful about things yeah. that can act as rogue transmitters. So that's going to be interesting to see play out, although I suspect it's a bit of a red herring and they're just covering themselves from a legal basis. Mm. If anything, it's going to be the more interesting of the Surface devices. As you said, the Surface Pro 3 was kind of like a modest upgrade. It was an upgrade that basically had USB Type-C, finally. And the Surface Laptop, as you said, there are, there are two of them in the Surface Laptop 3. Again, USB Type-C is part of the package. Now that there's an option for metal body or metal keyboard versus or metal covered keyboard versus the Alcantara fabric. And as you said, the 15-inch version comes with an AMD chip, which is, or there are two variations of it. One is uh, Radeon Vega in the ovens, um, or like Vega 9 versus mm. Vega RX, I think it is. So basically they're both graphically empowered more so than Microsoft's devices normally are, although the Surface Book is usually fairly graphically friendly. Um, but they were the fairly standard computers. Even the Surface Pro X, whatever we're going to call it, is fairly standard compared to the I guess, experimental devices Microsoft announced, which well, kind of came I mean, out look, of the blue. There have been rumors, and, 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 and Microsoft had this whole courier concept literally spanning back a decade. Mm. So they've been playing around with this idea of folding form factors. And, of course, as regular listeners will know, folding phones have been one of these big rolling things this week. Uh, this week, sorry, this year. It's been a long day. Uh, and Microsoft is going to be getting <laughs> into that game, but not until next year, with two fairly surprising devices for a start. They're getting back into phones. Yeah, and they're not getting back into Windows phones, which is possibly the most well, that's interesting they aspect. Well, want people to buy so, them this time. Oh, the, 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 <laughs> I still like them, but they weren't very good. I, I say that with the straightest face possible. Um, the Surface Duo is the one you're talking about right now, though, and that's a really interesting device. Uh, basically, it's uh, two 5-inch, or I think they're five point. 3 inch, 5.3 inch, 5.6 inch screens that are connected by a 360 degree hinge. So basically it's kind of like what LG tried with the, I guess with the uh, the V50, but in a way that's slim and you might actually want to use it. They look more like very small tablets linked together. So they have, I guess the f they look like they're a 5 to 3 aspect ratio, not like the 18 to 9 that we use on phones. And when they fold well, so when they when they connect together, when you collapse them, they kind of look like an eight point three inch tablet, and that's cool. The really cool part is it it runs Android, and that's not so unusual. I mean, it's unusual because it's Microsoft not like isn't Microsoft would have had the choice to run iOS. Let's face it. No, it's it's true, but they could have also built a version of of Windows. But Microsoft does have a launcher for Android. It has for quite some time. And it's actually not a bad launcher. I for for last year, I actually um, preferred it uh, over a lot of the other choices out there, and found it was very well designed. Um, but it's interesting because it's basically, from the looks of things, it's going to play uh, sort of like an attack against the Galaxy Note because it supports a Surface Pen, and it's an Android device that supports Microsoft apps and other apps to cross the screen in that eight-inch style or separately in, in, in two 5.6 inch devices it's it's a really cool device it looks like a, a proper notepad Look, in I'll a way admit, actually it's interesting and it's really interesting to see them jumping into the phone space although i can't help but feel that this is again microsoft using its surface brand to say hey this is our proof of concept idea everyone else go out and make things like this 
I mean, the model they showed off, for example, doesn't even mm-hmm. appear to have cameras on it yet, but they have said that it's not coming for quite some time. So presumably it will, and I suspect some of the specs that have been kicked around today will be substantially upgraded by the time it comes to market. The thing that really got me going, the, the, yeah. the device that they, they announced that actually got me genuinely excited, although I'm sure I won't be able to afford one, is the Surface Neo, because this is this is where I want yeah. folding devices to go. Yeah, so the Surface Neo is is kind of like it is genuinely an exciting piece of technology when you look at it. It's a it's essentially two. It, it's very similar to the Surface Duo. They're kind of um, but bigger and uh, better in just about every single way that I care about. Yeah, it's a bit. That's right. It's a it's a bigger and better version. So it's it's two nine inch screens uh, matched with a three sixty degree hinge, and while the other one's five point six inch screens um, turn into an eight inch device, this turns into a thirteen inch display. So you have that kind of interesting middle ground where you get a nine inch um, tablet, which is a nine inch tablet with a keyboard section that also runs as a tablet, or you can kind of collapse it and turn it into a unbearably big thirteen inch tablet, which might actually be useful now. Because you can actually make it do other things. And one of the cooler aspects of it, I found myself getting really excited as I read about it, was the fact that it also supports a physical wireless keyboard that you can put on the bottom section and it still keeps part of that second screen active. Because everyone knows typing on a screen for long periods of time is definitely not fun. It's 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 barely even usable. This would actually theoretically be a a, an entirely touchscreen device with a keyboard Look, that doesn't suck. I am perhaps suck. the most cynical journalist in the country, and I rolled my eyes when I was watching the early part of the Neo reveal because it's all and Microsoft engineering is quite nice. Don't get me wrong, but it's all little bolts coming together and circuit boards and the usual nonsense that we're yeah. kind of used to. But that point where they had the keyboard slide out over the lower screen to become almost well, essentially, it is a Surface device because this is this is Windows where the Surface Duo is Android. We should point out. But the point where they had that slide yep. out, it was like, whoa, I want this. And then and they had a, an almost kind of Mac-like touch bar thing at the top, and I thought, right, well, I'll never touch that. But then they slid it up to make the lower half <laughs> of the tablet into a, a touchpad, and it was like, yeah, now I really want this. In terms of getting me excited, which is quite a yeah. tricky job when I've been doing this for so long, it, it fulfilled the goods in all sorts of ways, although, of course, the problem is it is pretty much all just hype right now. They're not even bringing this thing to market for 12 months, yeah. and there's a ton of specs we just don't know. It, it It's pretty much everything we don't know about it. It's essentially two screens put together and, uh, and a hype video, and they're not talking a lot much about it outside of that. They are saying that the operating system it runs on, which is Windows 10, but it's Windows 10, it's an expression of Windows 10. That's their quote. Um, is this like it's these Windows horrible 10 restaurant X, menus which is basically... where you get an impression of a, mu- of a mushroom souffle <laughs> and it turns up and it's like a tiny fleck of something on the corner of a plate artisanally, you know, presented? I mean... I mean, look, it, it is entirely possible that, um, I mean, it's, it'll certainly cost you as much as one of those meals, sure. that much we can tell you. Um, but yeah, Windows 10 X, the expression of Windows 10, um, is apparently basically Windows 10 made for dual screens. I imagine that's what the X means. I don't know whether that means it's been redeveloped from the ground up and it's going to have problems in a way Windows 10 S did. We, we don't know anything about that. But um, Windows 10 S likewise could be upgraded to Windows 10 standard. So maybe it will be compatible. I, sh- I hope they've learned their lesson. The interesting part about the announcement for Windows 10 X was Microsoft saying that its Surface Neo won't be the only device that supports Windows 10 X and that by the time this rolls around in 2020, we'll actually have devices from Azus, from Dell, from Lenovo, basically from the regular assortment of players. So this idea of the Surface Neo might end up being just a really cool prototype functional concept that other companies make into something even more usable in a, in a very similar way to, I guess, what Intel's Ultrabook was that allowed uh, PC manufacturers to compete. Yeah, well, this has long Air. been Microsoft's statement about Surface. It didn't want to be competing with the likes of Dell and HP and Asus and Acer. It wanted to be providing a mm. kind of reference standard to say, hey, here's a really nice way you could do it. You should do very similar to this, which is why, you know, when those makers made things that and were as- very similar to a Surface, Microsoft didn't send in the lawyers and say, hey, no, those are our ideas. They basically said, cool, they've got Windows on them. We're still happy. 
That's true. And you look at HP's ones. HP's Surface style machines are almost identical to a Surface in what they do, with the exception of I think the the keyboard connectors and the stands are marginally different. And that that that's actually a good thing. Microsoft does really good concepts. I don't know if we're going to see anything quite like this. I mean, Lenovo's tried something like this in the past, and I don't remember it being totally amazing. I know Asus has a dual screen computer out now, and it's kind of it's it's got a keyboard and a dual screen section, as far as I understand it. But I've not played with that, so I I feel like this is a beautiful concept. But like most luxury concept cars. I don't know whether the reality Look, is going to match it. not, but it excites me at least because this is where I want foldables to go. And okay, this is a more traditional laptop form factor in some ways, but mm. this is where I want foldables to go. Not so much the, the Galaxy Fold or, the, or the, the Mate X, although they're interesting in their own way, but the one device, the idea of, right, no, no, I don't have a phone anymore. I don't have a laptop anymore. I have this thing on me that can be compact enough to be a phone or to be a tablet if I'm sitting somewhere and I just want to scroll through a magazine or whatever, but then I can then pull it out and actually do full productive work on it. I can't yet do that on an iPad Pro. I can do that on a tablet, but it's a bit, on a full laptop, but it's a bit too big and I've still got to have a phone with me. I want this one thing Mm -hmm. and I think this is pointing that way. See, for me, I like the idea that it's a nine-inch device. One of my bugbears of the PC and the laptop world in general is that I kind of feel like I'm forced to carry around a 13 or a 15 inch machine when what I really want is something smaller and more portable because that's kind of how I work. It I don't necessarily need a completely accurate, perfectly um, designed keyboard, but by the same token, I don't want whatever the hell Samsung put in its Galaxy Tab S6 or S4 because it's completely way off the mark. Um, I just kind of want a good device that I, that is portable and does those things. And if it has the phone in it, even better. For me, the foldable thing when it really becomes interesting is actually, like you, it's not kind of what we're seeing, I guess, from Samsung or Huawei or any of the other brands. It's kind of that idea that Motorola floated, which is, um, or that Motorola picked up on from a fan, I guess, which is a uh, a Motorola Android-style device that flipped closed to make a smaller device. I like the idea of carrying a smaller phone, not the palm, no way, um, but I like the idea of carrying a smaller phone that can turn into a slightly larger phone just by unfolding so back it. back when I was growing up, we actually had these things called magazines. And when I started as a journo, I didn't do a lot of magazine writing, but... It was still a thing. Now, we don't really have a lot of magazines, but we still have people who write magazines because we kind of have news services that do magazines like we do with Apple News Plus. What's that about? So Apple News Plus launched here this week, and the short rundown is it's yet another subscription service for Apple. They're just, they're just stacking them up. Apple Arcade, Apple News Plus, Apple TV Plus. It's all plus. It's all Apple all the time, it seems. This one will run you 15 bucks a month, well, $14.99 a month in Australia, and it gives you access to a range of subscription news services, some newspapers and a number of magazines. And, Jez, I know you're a man who, you know, effectively has ink and possibly also vinyl running <laughs> through your veins. Uh, does the prospect of Apple News Plus excite you? Well, the strange you? thing with Apple News, I've been using Apple News, like it's an app on your phone that I read news on when I'm on the bus going to work. So it's 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 something that I've known for years. And the plus basically is partly just letting you through the paywall for some of the stories, which regular users may have noticed it's been pushing you to more and more of late it seems but now you can if you pay your 15 bucks you get through to the 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 bowers and the murdochs of this world with through the paywalls but uh whether or not it's a bargain for 15 bucks a month remains to be seen what what i found with it's not the easiest thing to use until you find the magazine section and the magazine section is fascinating because some of it they've done relatively rich content for so you go into something like national geographic and they're using the fonts and the design style of a proper magazine whereas some of them are just uh, flipbook pdfs or it's just text like it's a website and that's less interesting to me and that's actually one of the things i noticed about it as well i mean it's it's trying to be a digital version of a magazine but i don't know necessarily whether it is you know achieve that result in a lot of instances because Th- those features are the things that make a magazine special. You know, all that extra writing makes a magazine more than just a website. And it has the features, 
but some of them, as you said, are basically just, you know, you could grab it on a PDF. They haven't really evolved the format, which is a shame because the whole Apple News thing, it means that it can resize to a device like an iPhone or iPad or a Mac. And you kind of want to see those features stand out even more. The responsiveness, I think, is crucial because this is going to work on an iPhone as well as an iPad. And magazines look good on an iPad anyway. I, I love looking at magazines on mm. an iPad. And I think having worked in magazines for this many years, the thing that gets lost in the translation to website is that the information is there and, you know, you can stick the pictures up, but the design disappears. And magazines are a combination of information and design. It's not just the information. So I've always actually been like, you know, when I put a story up on the website, I go, oh, yeah, you know, block of text picture, block of text picture. Whereas in a magazine, you know, you've got sidebars, you've got eye candy. It's, it's an interesting experience. And I know that magazine sales are down. And I know that print, you know, you can't represent yourself as a print publisher. People expect you to turn up in a top hat. But if, you know, so you have to be a publisher across multiple platforms. But mm-hmm. I still reckon that a created and curated page can be a beautiful thing it can actually lead you to the information more effectively than can text and a picture text and a picture that layout thing's really interesting as well because i wonder if there's the margin for a lot of the magazine publishers to build an apple news plus version a more interactive almost kind of more halfway house between web and magazine style experience all the time um one of the things that's actually struck me because they do a free trial which basically everyone in australia on yep. Apple News Plus at the moment is on unless they're mad for some reason, or unless you're listening <laughs> to this, I suppose, a few months from now and you've already had your sub. But there's a few things on there where I could say, well, look, they are only really serving a PDF. <laughs> so the magazine that I cut my teeth on, APC, is on there, for example. Um, and things like Retro Game, which is you know a magazine very close to my heart are there. But they're both basically just that PDF format. The thing being getting them each and every month would cost more than the subscription. So maybe that's where the pure value play comes in. Well, I think the other value angle of it is actually the newspaper side of things. I don't read many uh, News Corp titles uh, in, in full length, to be honest, but I, a part of me is hoping that more newspapers get on there because you do have, if you were an, you know, an Australian subscriber or a subscriber to the Australian rather, you do have that access as part of it. And that might begin to pay for itself quite well if you do happen to subscribe to titles like that and you want the magazines as well because they're on there. It's true, but it's news. It, 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 there's so much free news mm. out there that I still don't think news has got a viable paywall or subscription model. I mean, it, it it does give you access to the Herald Sun and the Telegraph and the Australian, whatever. But you can still get the ABC for free. You can get the BBC for free, the news yeah. sites. And and that really, that's, that's enough news for me. I, I see the value as the magazines. And if there's stuff on there that I would normally pay to buy then that's the thing that will get me over the line is the magazine content because that's expert and detailed and long form, as you say, Lee, is long form journalism. So so, so the thing that grabbed me about the trial was, uh, and I've always liked uh, the digital art sort of mags, the 3D um, animation sort of stuff because it's something I like doing in my spare time, even the, the digital music sort of stuff. The fact that those are actually on the platform because – they're not normal like that's the sort of stuff that doesn't really go onto a website remarkably well all the time those sorts of features are the sort of things that kind of grab me and i like knowing i have access to them and I, i'm probably unusual in this way when i read when, when i read an article i really like if i can only find it in a magazine and it stands out better i'll grab that to me it's kind of like using uh, apple music to test all my music or spotify or whatever and then going and buying the lossless uh, version or the vinyl yeah. uh, to me it's kind of like these are trial services and when i find the real the uh, the good high quality you version might be an out- that's when i there. go and buy it hmm. that's a nice way to look I, at I it i did want to circle like back on the newspaper thing though because it's it's pretty much on the newspaper side it's pretty much exclusively News limited publications, it's, as you say, you know, the, the Telegraph and the Courier Mail and the Oz and so on. And whilst I think mm. that's a reflection of the Australian media landscape, news has a, a huge footprint there. So it's reasonable that they're there. It's perhaps to me a little disconcerting in a news sense that it is this, you know, predominantly, uh, you know, I don't want to get super political, but predominantly very right wing 
media representation that's sitting there and perhaps having other services. But yeah. then I suppose that comes down to the kind of deal that you can cut with Apple because it's not as though Apple is shoveling that full fourteen ninety nine towards all the magazine and newspaper publishers every month. No, mm. having having said that, they have other stuff on there. It's just they're promoting the fact that you now have free access to those titles because those are the only ones that have tried paywalling. Murdoch is the big newspaper publisher that's been trying paywalling everywhere. So they're advertising the fact the Australian's there, but still on Apple News, you still go through to the Sydney Morning Herald and the BBC and the ABC stories. It's just that these are the ones you now get for free with your subscription. There's also a further point probably worth mentioning, and it actually goes to that point you had, Jez, about how you can find news anywhere, and it's that Apple News, if you have an iPhone, an iPad, or a Mac, is mm. free. Apple News Plus is not. Apple News is a is basically just a service that any publisher can join. I'm on it. I know Alex is on it. I'm sure your publications are probably on it as well, Jez, and the idea being that you can just sign up, follow someone that is familiar, and you'll get their stuff in in your feed, which is algorithmic so you get a, a regular feed of news from all around the web in a very pretty format that works in night mode and day mode on, on ios 13 and looks as good as a periodical because that's how the system works apple news plus is a premium service for the magazine side of things a little bit of that newspaper but as you said before there's so much news out there you don't need to subscribe to apple news plus you actually if, if you've got an iphone or ipad using news by itself Kind of, isn't this a magazine renders problem the same in a experience? Nutshell? Agreed. And there's actually the, the, the prospect of selling a magazine has become harder uh, in the web age, though. Isn't that just, isn't that not just Apple News, but the web entirely? This kind of gets to the big picture question I was going to ask around whether or not this is a good model for those longer form pieces, which are magazines are very good for, of course, uh, to, to thrive. Well, there have been some fantastic web presentation mm. of long form journalism and the Washington Post and uh, some of the, the New York Times has, has led some of that. Uh, I think I think, again, the value here is magazines. But you look at the Apple magazine list and it's not that long. I ironically, I've just started. I just joined my local library and I get 117 magazines free to read uh, in PDF form. For joining my library that I can download, mm. I can yeah, right. get I can get ebooks. Libraries I are wonderful get, places. Uh, people. I can get talking audio books, uh, mm. and there's the Canopy app, which you get access to as a member of your local library here in Sydney. Uh, and I can watch movies on Apple TV using that. And that's 117 mags on that. And Apple currently, when I looked today, had 141. So how much value is It's a really is good there? point. I'm glad you brought it up. That Apple is not alone in this kind of subscription to a bunch of magazine services. Um, and, and indeed, it's, I think it's well worth any of our listeners checking with their local library what they can actually get. It does, it does vary a little bit depending on where you are, but also internationally there are there are other subscription yeah. services, there are other freebie services and ways to get access to this content in which publishers, you know, are still eventually being paid. They're just being paid by the library or the local government or whatever it may be. But I suppose they've at least been generous enough to say, hey, you can try this thing for a month and as long as you remember to cancel, you'll get a month's worth of access which will kind of tell you where it is, they've also got that advantage that it is cross ecosystem. Apart from, I guess, Apple TV, it's also not. It's not just cross ecosystem. It's cross family. So the fourteen ninety nine is a is a family account, which is which is to say, if you're a single person reading it, there is no single selection like there is on Apple Music. It's a family account or nothing. So on one upside, you can share your family account of mag of, of magazines with your entire family or even friends, technically. But if you're using an iPhone, which is the only way really, or iPhone iPad to use this, if you put them under your family account. Those people can then buy things on your account. <laughs> yes, I saw that. <laughs> there is that challenge, and actually the iPhone brings up one of the other challenges I was going to point out with this, because I've been playing around with it. Jez, you said you were reading on an iPad. I've been looking on an iPad mini and an iPhone um, 11 Pro Max. And look, the 11 Pro Max is their largest phone. It's not a great magazine reading experience, nope. especially for those pdf fine things where you're zooming in, zooming out, finding a column, reading that column, going up to the next column. It's 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 a it's a bit of a faff. You you hope that the PDF style will start to disappear because this is a flash. They, they bought Texture, Apple bought Texture, which was a company that was doing the same thing. And 
back to about six issues ago, that's when it, the PDFs were all there. You hope that it'll progress to more uh, actual curated, properly visual content. So I remember um, writing about this last year at points, and I know you probably have, but TPG and Vodafone were kind of getting together. What's up with that? Well, nothing's up with that. The, the TPG Vodafone hookup is... Well, well, they're taking a break, shall we say, to be generous, uh, but it's it's a court mandated break, essentially oh, wow. speaking. The A Triple C that's a bad divorce. Block, yeah, sought to block the merger on competition grounds, um, so it never actually got to the divorce stage because they never got married. Right. Um, just to, to follow that analogy through terribly, <laughs> um, but the A Triple C sought to block the merger, and this week we've actually seen the court actions and the court arguments around whether or not that's a good idea or not. TPG has maintained and its argument has been that once Huawei's networking equipment was blocked from being in Australian mobile networks, especially with 5G, that it was it would not proceed with a network. It had already ploughed a great deal of money into in terms of building infrastructure and especially buying Spectrum. Um, and so therefore, there wasn't really a competition case to meet there. The ACCC seems very much determined and in its closing argument said, well, no, actually, we think if the merger was blocked, TPG would go ahead and build a fourth network. And yeah. I think it's really weird that the ACCC is arguing, well, we think you're going to do this and that's the basis of their competitive argument because I think there's actually stronger competitive arguments around this. Mm, absolutely. I, I find it weird that they would say that they would actually not have built it in the first place given how many articles they had us all build before the merger was on the table. Well, a lot of what's emerged in these court hearings have been the technical challenges that they faced and the possibly optimistic, and, and this is their own testimony, because, of course, they're arguing, no, we're not going to build it. The possibly optimistic projections and forecasts that they had for the number of people they might sign up. Now, they did come to market at one point, or they were going to come to market, I should say, with, I think it was like uh, $10 a month, one gig and then yep. unlimited, so the kind of Telstra Vodafone model of unlimited. It, it, it was un, it was unlimited on a daily basis. It reset yes, every exactly. day. It was a it was a, it was a it was a really weird and interesting idea. Yeah. But it seems like their argument is actually we probably couldn't have done that. Their coverage was always going to be very very weird. I mean, they only had a target of hitting eighty percent of the population, where the three existing networks hit ninety five percent, and that's by population base, not by land mass. That's really yeah. important in Australia. TPG would have been a pretty awful network for regional and rural users if it existed at all. It seems pretty likely they would have had to cut a deal, probably with Vodafone, to mm. try and roam onto their network when you're outside a TPG area. But the thing that really surprised me on this is that it's focused so heavily on the mobile network side of it that TPG would build that and not the reverse side of the equation, which I find more interesting, which is that Vodafone would suddenly have jumped way up the rankings in terms of broadband positioning. What do you mean? So TPG and Vodafone merge, and currently as it stands, TPG is by various metrics either the number two or number three broadband provider in Australia. Telstra is still up there as, you know, the big dog, but yep. TPG and its sub-brands, because it owns Internode and it owns IINet and it owns yeah, right. a host of others, some of whom I don't think are still operating. But still, TPG is big in broadband and it's always sold itself on that low-cost value option. It has IINet and, to an extent, Internode as its more premium brands, but it's all the same network. It's all the same company. Yeah, right. They are huge there. They are minuscule in mobile. They've yeah. had mobile plans, but they've only ever really bundled them in with the with the broadband. They've tended to just say, oh, yeah, look, you can have a SIM off if you want. Their deals have been okay, but really stellar. That's where they sat. Vodafone, on the other hand, third player and, and definitively third behind Optus and Telstra in mobile, but still very, very large, large customer base, and they've done a lot of work since the you know bad old Vodafone so, days. That's, that's right, seriously competitive in, in roaming, one of the only – Really competitive roaming yes, players. Yes, absolutely. Their, 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 their roaming deal is still effectively the gold standard yeah. in terms of the big Australian telcos. You're absolutely right. But their broadband play was quite late to market. They came to market only with NBN, only in small areas. Yep. So they've got a tiny little part. You smash those two together and both sides win and benefit as businesses. I'm not talking in the competitive landscape totally. here. 
But on broadband, Vodafone suddenly becomes this huge, huge player. And it just doesn't feel to me like that's, that side of things has been addressed in a competitive sense at all because I would say that blocking the merger would force Vodafone to get more aggressive on its broadband side mm. in a way that it wouldn't have to if it merged with TPG. Well, that's just about it for another episode of Vertical Hold. Jez, if folks want to track you down on social media or online, where can they find you? avhub.com.au for me. Lee, same question. Uh, picker.com.au or therap.com.au. And we're always keen to hear your feedback. A magazine's back now that we have Apple News Plus. Would you subscribe to a theoretical TPG mobile network? Let us know via Twitter, that's at verticalhold.au, or the Vertical Hold Facebook page. Thanks to Jez for joining the show. Thank you, guys. And thanks for Lee for filling in and hosting duties yet again. Oh, thanks, guys. And thanks, as always, to everyone who tuned it in on your podcasting platform of choice. It's usually Adam's job to bang on about it, but we really do appreciate all of your shout-outs and reviews, so keep them coming. Vertical Hold is proudly sponsored by CASA Systems, taking Australian technology to the global market.